Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Lee Jampa. And I'm Sani Bridget. Thanks so much for joining us. Our top stories. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she wants good relations with China, but that requires a level playing field. Israeli military dismisses two officers and disciplines three others for their roles in the airstrike that killed seven foreign aid workers in Gaza. It is time to step back from the brink, to silence the guns, to ease the horrible suffering. A plea from the head of the United Nations for Israel to end its operation in Gaza as the conflict approaches the six-month mark. And is peak season for China's tea farmers and the Qingming Festival marks the start of the lucrative spring harvest. The U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen kicked off her visit to China, saying she wants good relations between the two countries, but that requires a level playing field. Speaking in the city of Guangzhou, Yellen said that China's manufacturing of certain goods was beyond what the global market can bear. She told business leaders that overcapacity was a problem that had recently intensified. Earlier this year, China said that claims of overcapacity are groundless and unfair. I believe we have taken up the challenge from our leaders to put the U.S.-China relationship on a more solid footing. As I have said, the United States seeks a healthy economic relationship with China that benefits both sides. But a healthy relationship must provide a level playing field for firms and workers in both countries. CGTN's Zheng Chunying has the latest from Guangzhou. U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen has just wrapped up her first full-day meeting in China's manufacturing hub, Guangzhou, uh, where she met with Vice Premier Ho Lifeng and held talks with him. Uh, although not much details has been released by Chinese authorities yet, there are some highly anticipated and hotly discussed issues on the agenda. Uh, for example, uh, including some of the disagreements between the two sides, um, like the broadening of U.S.'s technological restrictions on Chinese companies and on the U.S.'s side, what Yellen claims China's industrial overcapacity will also likely be raised. And apart from these, during the meetings, Yellen uh, is also expected to seek more opportunities for cooperation with China on issues like countering illicit finance, or bolstering financial stability, addressing climate change, uh, and resolving debt distress in the, some of the developing countries. And earlier this morning, the secretary also met with uh, some economic experts and uh, business representatives from the U.S. enterprises as well. And looking ahead, there is also a very uh, packed schedule for Secretary Yellen in China. Uh, she's going to travel to Beijing and uh, another three full days of meetings at Zerhat, uh, where she's going to meet with other high-level Chinese officials, including Premier Li Qiang, Finance Minister Lan Fuan, uh, People's Bank of China Governor uh, Pan Gongsheng, and so on. And the U.S.'s Treasury Secretary's travel comes right after U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping had their first call in five months on Tuesday. Uh, according to some of the experts that I've spoken to, they believe that uh, it was meant to demonstrate a return to regular leader-to-leader -leader dialogue between the two uh, powers. And let's not forget that there had been almost a year's break in communication between the two powers until President Biden and President Xi Jinping met last year in San Francisco. And this is Yellen's second trip since then. So her trip uh, is believed to add to the stability in the China-U.S. relationship, given a sense that communications can continue even amid uh, so many disagreements between the two sides. Earlier, I spoke to Stephen Roach, a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center from Yu Law School. He told me what Yellen might achieve on this trip. Well, I think this trip is part of the ongoing uh, diplomatic uh, dialogue between uh, the U.S. and China that Yellen herself started uh, a little less than a year ago with her mission uh, to uh, Beijing. You know, there's discussion that 
She's going to raise concerns about uh, China's uh, excess production, overcapacity in a world that uh, has a hard time absorbing that. But I think um, there's very little uh, uh, in the way of expectations that that will uh, uh, achieve much progress. I would prefer that she phrase this in a more constructive tone as, a mo as opposed to a threatening tone. Uh, the flip side of excess capacity is that China has weak domestic demand, especially internal private consumption. And I would hope that uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary would use the occasion to stress the longstanding rebalancing imperatives of the Chinese economy that many, including myself, have been stressing for over 15 years. And Yella hinted that the surge in China's exports of um, electric cars and solar panels and batteries was creating a problem at a time when the U.S. has uh, invested heavily in reviving its own manufacturing sector. Do you think it's because she is trying to um, her statements in favor of the U.S. only? Well, look, she is um, uh, a leading, if not the leading, spokesman for the official view of the U.S. economy, and manufacturing-led growth is a, a major emphasis of the Biden administration, uh, and uh, any uh, bumps in the road uh, on the path to manufacturing-led revival will be countered uh, by political statements like this. But, you know, China's efforts at uh, electric vehicles, solar, uh, and batteries certainly uh, fit uh, the, the script of um, uh, dealing with, with climate change that the U.S. and other developed uh, uh, countries are very much in favor of. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy here uh, in that point of view. Um, Yellen also says she wouldn't rule out the possibility of trade barriers. So do you think that China and the U.S. can afford to have an escalated trade war, which started in 2018? Well, the, the, the tariffs of the Trump administration have surprisingly remained intact during the Biden administration. I think that's too bad. Uh, the tariffs, I think, do, do damage uh, to, to both nations, and um, uh, I, I don't think they can be justified on economic terms. They, they draw their support from uh, a political positions uh, of uh, uh, the Trump administration that have been embraced by the uh, the Biden administration, and personally, I think the sooner they are reduced, the better, but we do not seem to be going in that direction. So as Janet Yellen visits Beijing, China's Commerce Vice Minister Wang Shouren is in Washington, where he's raised concerns over U.S. trade restrictions. Let's get more from our correspondent, John Terrett, who is in New York. Hello, John. So they're talking yep. in D.C. as well. Yes. Hey, Sally. Yeah, I think the background, though, is Janet Yellen and this quite historic trip that you've been reporting on there. And the fact that the major U.S. TV network CNBC is devoting so much time to her trip to Guangzhou and to Beijing and will feature a major interview with her, a sit-down with her and one of their big anchors on Monday, I think is very significant. This is not something we've seen quite on this scale up until this point. But in Washington, D.C., as you know, as you just said, there is Wang Xiaowen. He's the vice minister for commerce and he's been meeting his Washington, D.C. counterpart, who is called Marissa Largo. Now, this was the first of a series of meetings, the first one, though, of the China-U.S. working group. And on the table in the past 24 hours has been the issue of tariffs imposed by both sides, but particularly as they pertain to China from Washington, D.C., and market access, seeking greater access to this market here of 350 million people, and also discussing about the notion of decoupling and pushing that away. Decoupling is something that's very much an academic argument. I don't think the politicians are really on board with it, as the Yellen trip and as this trip by Wang Xiaowen, I think, demonstrates. From the Chinese side, then, it was all about 
tariffs and market access. From Marissa Largo's side, she raised the issue of some Chinese working practices and overproduction, just as you heard just now in that clip that you played from Janet Yellen. This is a big issue in America, and I'll tell you one area where it comes to the fore, and that is solar panels. The U.S. accuses China of overproducing its solar panels, for example, and so driving down the price and driving out of business country companies in this country that are involved in that particular industry. That's a concrete example of what they mean by overproduction. And, of course, all of this comes just days after President Xi and President Biden got together in a telephone conference or a Zoom conference, whatever it was, to check up on progress as a result of the APEC summit, which was held in San Francisco last November, which really kicked all of this off. You know, we had a whole succession of politicians and top business people from America visiting Beijing last year. They're still doing it this year. We had Wang Yi, of course, over respected diplomat in Washington, D.C. last October. And, you know, there's talk about other big-name politicians from America going to Beijing. But it was the APEC summit that really sparked all of this. So, John, news from the U.S. itself, March job figures are out, and they grew by over 300,000. Was that a surprise? Surprise? Are you kidding me? I mean, seriously, jaws were on the floor here. They were literally on the floor when that number... No, I'm not even joking. They were. When we saw a three on the number, we couldn't believe it because the gloom crew as we call economists, because it's the dismal art, don't forget, have got it so wrong again. None of them came even close again. Let me give you the numbers. So in March, the economy created 303,000, not 214,000, the economist told us to look out for. Last time round, they revised it from 275 to 270. The unemployment rate at 3.8%, and wages bang in line with the expectations. So the jobs came from government jobs, health care, and leisure and hospitality, manual Manufacturing, for example, was completely flat. So the thing is, it, jobs are robust in some areas, but not all areas of the economy. But that report was worryingly stronger than anybody had anticipated. And as a result, Wall Street is now expecting only two interest rate cuts this year, and now not starting until September. They started out looking for six beginning in March, and now they don't expect one until uh, the earliest September. But the overall trend in inflation, I think, the overall trend, including in this document today, is for inflation coming down still. That's the trend. The Federal Reserve has said it will base all its decisions on data. So there's likely, I think, to be an interest rate cut before the election. And based on that, the markets are rallying today after a 3% drop yesterday. The Dow is up 1%, and so is the S&P 500. The yields are higher. Gold is at $34 up today on where it was yesterday, and oil Brent is at $91 a barrel, and that's being caused by worries about what's going on in the Middle East. Guys? John, I can't let you go without asking uh, about reports we're hearing of an earthquake that has hit New York today. First of all, is everyone safe? Let me say at the outset, okay, that we recognize and understand the significance of what happened in Taiwan yesterday, okay, where there were deaths. However, it is very, very, very rare to have an earthquake of this magnitude in the New York area. And we had one at 10.19 this morning. Turns out to be in Hunterdon County, New Jersey, which is about 40 kilometers that way. That was the epicenter. They do happen overnight quite frequently, but not on this scale. 4.8 is really quite a lot. And people were really rattled by it. I was in the office upstairs. Apparently, according to my friends here, the screens on the posts were rattling. People were really quite nervous. Dust was falling from the ceiling, all that kind of stuff. Now, there are no reports from the fire department or from the governor of New York or the mayor of New York of any serious injuries. No building collapses, nothing like that. They did close the Holland Tunnel for a while, which they have to do to check it. There was a ground stop at the airports, and I think that some of the air trains going to the airports were suspended. So it looks like we've got away with it. Um, thank goodness for that. But it's a very rare and rather sort of, well, I'm not quite sure what the word is, really, a destabilizing event. Event, really. I mean, it's not every day the ground moves under your feet, and we surely felt it a couple of hours ago today. Well, glad you're all safe there. Yes, it is indeed quite unusual. Thank you so much. John Terry to New York. Well, Apple is cutting more than 600 jobs after reportedly dropping its plans to build a self-driving car. The job losses in California are the company's first layoffs since the pandemic. 
Apple is thought to have spent billions of dollars on developing a fully autonomous electric vehicle. The world's biggest maker of Apple's iPhone says it expects second quarter revenue to rise after posting an annual dip of nearly 10% in the first three months of the year. Taiwan-based Foxconn reported Q1 revenue of just over $41 billion in what is traditionally a quiet period for smartphone manufacturers. Samsung says it expects profits to jump by more than 900% for the first three months of the year on the back of rising microchip prices and soaring demand on AI-related products. The South Korean tech giant says it expects operating profits to rise to just under $5 billion, signaling a major recovery after a series of poor results. Samsung will post its full financial statement at the end of the month. Chip giant NVIDIA and Indonesia's telecommunications firm PT Indosat TBK are planning to jointly build a $200 million artificial intelligence center in Surakarta City. Indosat said in a statement that it is committed to pioneering AI development in Indonesia. Chinese EV company NIO is expanding its battery swap services as it looks to gain an edge on EV infrastructure. More cars will be added to its network, which already includes Chang'an, Jili, Cherry and JAC. NIO says it has clocked up more than 40 million battery swaps. The process to swap the batteries only takes around two and a half minutes and is fully automated. You're watching CGETN still ahead. Iran says it will punish Israel over its alleged role in the killing of seven officers in a strike on its embassy in Syria. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business only on CGTF. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen, so it's, it's, it's a necessity. Well, China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back. Israel's military says the attack on a convoy of foreign aid workers in Gaza was a case of mistaken identity. Two senior officers have been dismissed and three others reprimanded for their roles in the strikes that killed seven World Central Kitchen staff members. Poland has demanded that Israel investigate what it says is the murder of one of its citizens. The UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution on Friday for Israel to be held accountable for possible war crimes in Gaza. While welcoming Israel's admission on the strikes, the UN's Secretary General called for it to go further. Fixing those failures requires independent investigations and meaningful and measurable changes on the ground. In the aftermath of this tragedy, 
The United Nations was also informed by the Israeli government of its intention to allow a substantial increase in humanitarian aid distributed in Gaza. I sincerely hope that these announced intentions are effectively and quickly materialized because the situation in Gaza is absolutely desperate. And now let's uh, go live to our correspondent Alex Cartier in Tel Aviv. Alex, great to see you there. So we know that two senior officers have been dismissed and uh, that the reports answer all the questions about how this happened. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have a much clearer picture of what happened, how it happened, where answers are still needed, and according to a lot of, uh, certainly according to World Central Kitchen, is why it happened. Now, as to what happened, we understand from the IDF that a series of mistakes were made, including communications breakdowns, a breach of protocol, and misidentification of targets. Communications breakdown because despite World Central Kitchen communicating their route to the Israeli Defense Forces and traveling on an IDF approved route uh, the information was not passed on to the commanders in the field so those operating the drone and then firing the drone at this convoy had not been given the information provided to the IDF by World Central Kitchen. When it comes to the misidentification of targets, initially the commanders on the ground, according to the IDF, saw one or two armed men near the convoy on a truck and despite the three cars leaving the warehouse later without the truck and without the armed man visible, the drone still opened fired a fire on three separate occasions on each car. And that's despite uh, the survivors of the first hit trying to seek refuge in the second car. When that was hit, the third car came to provide assistance and was hit as well. That is what the IDF is describing as a breach of protocol. Now, the question of why it happened is where you hear a very strong condemnation from aid agencies, including the World Central Kitchen. They call for an independent commission to investigate this. They do not accept that the Israeli Defense Forces can investigate themselves, but they see this kind of strike as a systemic uh, issue, a systemic issue in the way that Israel is conducting this war that may result in more aid agencies and aid workers losing their lives. And that's the kind of warning we've also heard from Israel's allies. They want to make sure very clearly that this never happens again, including uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. Uh, even more important is making sure that steps are taken going forward to ensure that something like this can never happen again. Yeah, Alex, apart from pressure from the U.S., UN Human Rights Council has also adopted a resolution calling for halt to arms sales. So has Israel reacted so far? Yeah, very strong reaction from the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and the international organi organizations in Geneva. Ambassador Shahar is saying that all that matters to this council and many of its members is condemning the state of Israel and defending the Hamas terrorist organization as well as anyone else who seeks to harm and destroy us. We had a similar uh, sentiment echoed by the, uh, uh, the, the Israeli foreign minister in a statement saying that uh, this is an anti-Israeli resolution and equates the hostages being held in Gaza with uh, Palestinian prisoners accused of terrorist acts and in prison in Israel. So clearly a very strong reaction from Israel when it comes to this condemnation from the Human Rights Council, pushing back very firmly on the allegations and realistically on the ground it will not make a big difference because the Israelis have had now a quite a long-standing frustration and distrust of the United Nations uh, institutions, of particularly UNRWA, that UN aid agency working in the Palestinian territories, which 12 of their staff were accused of, uh, of taking part in the October 7th terrorist attack. What may change things, and this is what we've seen in the last couple of days, is the United States putting increased pressure on Israel when it comes to accountability in the way it conducts this war and having more humanitarian aid going into the Gaza Strip to, to avoid that looming famine there. We've seen the Israeli government say they will do more. Now the United States and others want to make sure that actually happens. Thanks, Alex. That is our correspondent, Alex Cartier in Tel Aviv. Well, our correspondent, Noor Harazin, is in Gaza's southern city of Rafa. She says people desperate for supplies are watching the aid situation closely.
Talking about Palestinians here, ordinary people on the ground, they were actually scared uh, when uh, this news was announced. And the reason why is because they started talking about maybe this means that Israel will invade the city of Rafah. Maybe the uh, Rafah border will uh, be closed. Uh, the Karim Abu Salem border will be closed. Is this a new humanitarian aid route to open to the Gaza Strip and in a way to invade the city of they had all of these uh, very scary uh, questions. They do, people here on the ground, fear the uh, Israeli ground invasion of Rafah. Uh, however, talking about this Israeli decision to open the uh, Ashdod uh, port and also to open the Erez uh, crossing that uh, was uh, closed since the 7th of October, this comes after the uh, phone call between uh, Joe Biden and Netanyahu and uh, apparently in a readout of that uh, call, uh, Joe Biden warned as well of uh, it must, must uh, take preventions of the killing of civilians. However, reading was happening here on the ground, and according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, 82 Palestinians were killed in Gaza today, and this brought up the death toll here in the coastal enclave up, up to uh, 33,120 Palestinians. 75 of them are children and women. Horrific stats. The UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, is saying that people in northern Gaza surviving on less than 12% of their average daily calories. Talk to us about the food situation, how people are coping. Well, yes, the situation is just going from bad to worse. Even here, talking about cities in the south, I am in Rafah city, and the situation is just getting harder uh, every uh, single uh, day that passes. I mean, there is less aid that is entering Gaza, even though there is uh, weekly reports from the UN, the Oxfam, the World Health Organization, the UNICEF. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, weekly reports about a famine in Gaza, about the uh, male nutrition here in the coastal enclave. However, what is happening on the ground is that rarely there is any changes. But uh, talking about some of the highlights, actually today um, a number of food trucks were allowed to the uh, north of uh, the Gaza Strip. Most of these trucks were loaded with vegetables and uh, fruits, specifically bananas. And this is the first time since the 7th of October where bananas is allowed to northern Gaza. However, uh, these fruits and vegetables are being sold at a very expensive price. We are talking about uh, 9 to 10 dollars per kilogram of uh, uh, the fruits or vegetables. Again, this is a very, very expensive uh, price. Uh, while Palestinians since the 7th of October have been suffering in this deteriorating question, uh, uh, situation, we are talking about the stopping of salaries, uh, no uh, working businesses. So yes, the situation is just going uh, from bad uh, to worse. Well, Iran has repeated its pledge to punish Israel for the deaths of seven officers killed in a suspected Israeli airstrike on Tehran's consulate in Syria. The funeral was held on the annual al Qas Day, which has been marked on the last Friday of Ramadan each year since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. It's an international day during which Iran stages large-scale state-sponsored pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel rallies. Our correspondent Aysan Kivani is in Banda Abu. Today, April 5th, International Goats Day is being commemorated in cities across Iran as well as in many other Muslim countries. The Goats Day or Jerusalem Day is an annual pro-Palestinian ceremony held on the last Friday of the Islamic Holy Month of Ramadan, expressing support for Palestinians and uh, opposing Israel and Zionism. Uh, this year's rallies are different from previous years as a few days ago in an unprecedented move, uh, Israel targeted Iran's consulate building in Syria, capital Damascus, and killed seven members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, two of them high-ranking commanders. Uh, I'm currently in the southern Iranian port city of Bandar Abbas, and as you can see behind me, angry people are chanting anti-Israel slogans. Uh, today, a funeral procession is being held in the Iranian capital, 
Tehran before the Friday prayers at the University of Tehran. Uh, the bodies of the military advisors will then be transferred to uh, their respective provinces and cities for burial. Uh, Iranian officials, in particular the supreme leader, have vowed uh, retaliation against Israel's aggression. On Wednesday, uh, Supreme Leader and uh, Commander-in-Chief Ayatollah Ali Khamenei uh, had said Israel will receive a slap in the face for the recent attack. Uh, therefore, many are expecting a punitive attack on Israel by Iran or anti-Israel armed groups. Meanwhile, uh, the Israeli military has been on high alert since Monday's targeting of Iran's diplomatic complex. Ehsan Keivani, CGTN, Bandar Abbas. Rescue efforts are continuing in Taiwan to find more than a dozen people still missing following Wednesday's powerful earthquake. Survivors from the 7.2 magnitude quake, which struck the mountainous and sparsely populated eastern county of Hualien, have been airlifted to safety. Search crews are facing the threat of further landslides and rockfalls. The death toll from Taiwan's worst earthquake in 25 years has now risen to 12. Mm. At least 1,000 people were injured. You're watching CGTN Still Ahead. The new technology that's helping to keep skiers away from danger and save lives in the Austrian Alps. Perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? Brazen acts. The difference is in the detail, in the background, Defense Minister is from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN, see the difference. Across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Li Jianhua and Sally Burdett. The headlines again. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she wants good relations with China, but that requires a level playing field. Israeli military dismisses two officers and disciplines three others for their roles in the airstrike that killed seven foreign aid workers in Gaza. The UN Secretary General pleads for Israel to end its operation in Gaza and the conflict approaches the six-month mark. 
Chinese car giant Cherry is launching in the United Kingdom. The automaker, which has been China's largest car exporter for more than 20 years, has set up two new sub-brands, Omoda and Jaiku, especially for the international market. It's one of a number of Chinese car brands eyeing the European and UK markets as a major source of growth. Our correspondent Siobhan Mukul went along to his London launch event. Meet a mode of five. The first car to launch in the UK under Cherry's international brand. Available in both electric and petrol, it's a mid-size SUV that's aiming to rival the likes of Nissan's Qashqai and Hyundai's Kona. The company believes a combination of futuristic design and value for money will be a winning formula with customers. I think in a segment where it is difficult to stand out, um, our cars do stand out. So I think that's a really good start. So I think that's enough to get the sort of the interest. We call it sort of affordable premium. So um, we benchmark against sort of a lot of the premium brands. We're trying to bring those attributes, that design, the materials, the quality, um, the kind of level of features that you'd expect, but at a price point that perhaps people wouldn't expect. The Amoda 5 is expected to cost around $30,000 for the petrol model and $42,000 for an EV. Its sister brand, Jaiku, which will launch in the second half of this year, has been marketed as more high-end and rugged. Its price tag is closer to $45,000. At a working breakfast to mark the London launch, Amoda executives spoke to journalists about the importance of localization. Amoda is already scouting out locations for a British assembly plant and says the UK is a market with lots of promise. China became the world's top EV market last year with around 5 million vehicles shipped worldwide. And as more Chinese brands including Amoda and Jaiku enter the UK and European markets, auto experts predict that China will have around a sixth share of the UK's competitive car market by 2030. Chinese brands already operating in the UK include one of the world's biggest EV companies, BYD, along with MG and Great Wall Motor. While Neo, Xpeng and Serres are among those expected to launch within the next year. But as an increasing number of Chinese cars appear on British and European roads, questions are being asked whether the influx, particularly electric vehicles, could hurt European car makers. The European Union has opened an investigation into whether Chinese EV companies are receiving state subsidies and it could impose tariffs, something that Beijing has criticized as protectionist behavior. And there's also the question of whether the EV market is slowing down, with Tesla reporting a sharp fall in worldwide sales and Mercedes-Benz delaying its electrification goals. Amoda still believes the future will be electric, fueled by battery technology advances, and it's working on battery sustainability solutions. We have, for example, in this car, we have uh, what's known as LFP technology, so it's a slightly different construction uh, of lithium battery. Uh, it's more sustainable, it uses less lithium, less precious metals. As the first cars are set to arrive at UK dealerships, Amoda is aiming for around 10,000 sales in its first year and hopes to increase to 50,000 a year by 2028. Siobhan McCall, CGTN, London. Anti-coup forces in Myanmar have launched an unprecedented drone attack on the capital, Naypyidaw. The National Unity Government, which was formed to oppose the 2021 coup, said it launched a drone attack on two military targets in the capital, the centre of the army's power. Military-run state TV said it shot down 13 fixed-wing drones in what they described as a foiled attack by terrorists. Cuba says it secured enough food to feed its population after shortages led to protests last month. The government says it can guarantee basic items like rice until the end of June and is working to secure supplies of other essentials. Cuba has long given its citizens monthly food rations but has been hit hard by US sanctions and the pandemic. A UK company hoping to launch the first solar farm into space has passed a critical milestone with a prototype on Earth. Space Solar says it plans to power more than a million homes by the 2030s. The concept requires solar panels similar to those used on Earth but in orbit to turn sunlight into electricity, which is then converted into microwave, 
to be beamed from space into an Earth station connected to the local grid. The company says if successful, it would produce more renewables than terrestrial equivalents. A Japanese startup which specializes in the removal of space junk is said to be considering a listing on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Sources say Astroscale has been speaking to overseas investors to gather feedback before making a decision. The company is developing technology to remove space debris and extend the life of satellites. New online tools are helping to save lives in the Austrian Alps. Hikers and skiers can use the apps to track safe routes through the mountains and avoid potential hazards. A correspondent, Johannes Pleschberger, reports. Dying in an avalanche when going off piste is still possible, but less likely. Deadly accidents are actually decreasing. Uh, because uh, there is so much information and people are so much uh, more aware of it. In the past years, the number of free riders and tourers in the Alps has doubled, while avalanche-related deaths have slightly declined. This is partly thanks to online tools like Skitouren Guru, which show skiers a safe route through dangerous snow patches. Those new apps bring us a lot of safety because they uh, have a lot of information in it. So we know how dangerous it is, how steep it is, and, yeah, and it's super easy to use. But even the best prepared can end up in an avalanche. Radios to locate and shovels to free victims are standard equipment. But witnesses are often overwhelmed and in shock. Austria now offers a new virtual reality simulator that lets users practice for such an emergency. After virtually packing the necessary items, a buried person has to be located and excavated. For now, the German language Notfall Wiener app is only accessible with VR glasses. However, even though the risk of dying in snow masses is decreasing, one factor remains constant. Almost all deadly avalanche victims are male. Experts say women tend to be more aware of risky behavior. Johannes Blechberger, CGTN, Goldeck Mountain in Austria. You're watching CGTN Still Ahead. We speak to Chinese professional heavyweight boxer Zhang Jilei about his hopes to bring a fight to China. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. Far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control... The economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is firmly on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day, on CGTN. Welcome back. China's Qingming Festival is underway as travel data reveals that nearly 300 million people traveled across the country at the start of the three-day holiday. More than a thousand extra trains were added to railways on Thursday. To meet the huge surge in demand, kids bring to around 70 million passengers. Nearly 280 million people drove on the highways. Qingming or Tomb Sweeping Day is when people remember their dead and pay tribute to their ancestors. This year, it runs from Thursday to Saturday. 
Well, the Qingming or Tomb Sweeping Festival also marks the start of another important event, and that is the spring harvest of tea. And China is believed to be the birthplace of tea drinking for thousands of years. It's played an important cultural and social role. The uh, earliest credible record dates back to the 3rd century AD, but legend had that it was around some 500 years earlier. And in 2022, China produced more than 3 million metric tons of tea, accounting for nearly half of global production here. And roughly 60% of China's tea production is green tea, which is made from unoxidized leaves. In 2022, China exposed, exported tea worth over $2 billion. And the most expensive tea was launched in 2012, with a price tag equating to 200 US dollars per cup. Dubbed panda dung tea is so special because it's fertilized by the nutrient-rich feces of pandas. And it once again has more from eastern China's Zhejiang province. This part of eastern China has a history of tea farming going back 150 years. More than 300 types of tea have been produced here. It's tea harvest season for farmers here. It's the busiest time of the year. The price of tea varies each day, and it's also a race against times. For Chunjian County, East China's Zhejiang province, which has over 1,600 acres of tea land, farmers are working in full swing to embrace the spring harvest. There are 30 cooperatives in Chunjian County which rely on tea farming to generate income. Making green tea is complicated involving multiple processes. Local residents work around the clock to harvest the tea. Due to the heavy workload, most of the tea processing has moved from human hands to machines, which has greatly increased productivity. 26-year-old Ping Jiayi grew up in this town. Her grandparents own acres of tea farming land. She used to watch them roast tea leaves by hand, selling them in the market and working day and night. In 2019, Ping quit her job in Shanghai and came home to open the community's first tea store, transforming an old warehouse into a tea factory. Our town has more than 1,500 acres of tea farming land, and every household owns some acres of tea farming land. But every household has different picking and tea making standards. People just sell to the local market. Farmers don't have the right to set the price. After I came back, I gathered all the tea farmers to set the standards for picking and making tea, unifying the brand and sale channel, which increased tea farmers' profits. The tea industry created 5,000 jobs in Chunjian County, and the profits from tea farming are set to account for over one-third of the income earned by local residents. In 2020, drone technology was used for the first time to monitor farmland, and the Chunjian tea industry also received government subsidies. A year later, spring tea output exceeded 130 million yuan. We have the smart tea land strategy, which has been carried out in three aspects. The first is to have a database of all basic information on the tea farming land. The second is to use new technology like sensing, drip irrigation, drones to give analysis on seedlings, improving soil and air quality, analyzing pests and diseases, controlling every aspect of cultivation. The third are internet cells, which are traceable. People can trace where the tea is grown. Now the local government wants to combine tea culture and tourism. The 2020 Chinese hit TV series Nothing But 30 was filmed in Chunjian County. There are also plans to start tea study tours and enable visitors to experience making tea. The air is filled with the delightful aroma of tea, which means it's time to take the first sip of this year's fresh brew and have a taste of spring. Wang Sun, Xi Jitian, Chunjian County, Zhejiang Province. All right, well, let's speak to Zhu Yan Webster. She is the owner and founder of the Chinese tea company in London. Thank you so much 
for joining us. The Qingming Festival, it's the prime season for tea farmers, of course. Tea is not just a drink. It's also really important culturally in China. I wonder if you could just give us an understanding of that. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to the program. So the tea, of course, is the Qingming Festival. As you mentioned in the program, we all go and want to travel back home to visit the families, uh, friends as well. So. And it's tea season, so I'm also come from Zhejiang province. For us, it's so important to buy even small little quantity of fresh season tea to be able to bring back home to share with the family. So it's something you can share, gathering, and also, you know, it's perfect weather to drink them. So it's, a, it's all about the unite with the family, have a good time, have a little something refreshing up to, to drink together. Um, so mm. that's, uh, you know, it's that's a kind of daily, every day. You know, we even kind of need to apologize to guests to come to the house if we couldn't offer a fresh cup of tea right now. <laughs> if you come to my house, I will literally will have to apologize to you if I'm in China. But obviously, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I have to ask you. Uh, sorry to jump in. You are a yeah. tea sommelier. In other words, you're a tea expert. You run a tea shop. Um, talk to me about what makes the perfect cup of tea. I'm guessing it's not milk and two sugars. <laughs> oh, definitely not. So if you want to really enjoy what the tea tastes like, you've got to drink a tea on its own and there's so much more flavor for you to discover. So what to make a good cup of tea, to be honest, the most, the simplest ingredient is to have a relatively high quality teas. That's very important. And it's not necessarily have to be expensive. And uh, once you have a good quality, because these are the ones offer you nice flavor. And then the second thing is about the water. You need to have a, a good quality water. So I'm myself based in London, and a lot of people know about London. The tap water has not been great. So if you're trying to brew uh, some very delicate green tea or white tea, you're just not going to taste the tea very well. So you have a good uh, water. Once you get that, that's the basic ingredient. And then come with the brewing, you know, the temperature and brewing time. So temperature is quite important, but it depends on what the tea you are brew. So take example of green tea, usually, especially the green tea right now being harvested, is extremely the most delicate, extremely young leaves. So they can be easily be spoiled by boiling water. So we tend to advise people to using something around the 85 mm. to 90 degree to brew. So if you use boiling water, it's quite easy to be spoil the leaf, and then you get a bit of flavor. <laughs> so, I that is the... so that's the way to get it right. Water qualities. I didn't know about that. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's there are so important. many. There's so many tea trends. Um, bubble tea, all these exotic flavors and infusions. What do you think about that? Um, to be honest, that's not what I'm thinking of. Uh, tea is a, a, a tea-based drink. That's what I, I would call it. <laughs> and because, you know, it's take a, quite away from the tea, the original tea's flavor. But it has been very, very popular. But I, in my opinion, it still is better than nothing. So especially for the young people, you know, they think, oh, drinking tea, this is what my parents do or my grandparents do. So at least they can drink something related to with the tea. <laughs> Hopefully when they get a little bit more mature, they're thinking, oh, I, do, I can't take any more sugar, cream anymore. So why not take them away just to drink the tea yourself? All right. And very quickly, what is your favorite? I'm South African. I love rooibos tea. Here in England, the builder's tea tea is very popular. What for you is the yeah. best tea to drink? Um, that's very hard to say, actually, because I, in the business, so I've got so many different teas. Um, if, if I'm in London, daily drinking tea, I prefer oolong tea, such as a Wuyi Rock tea or Phoenix Danton. But also, I come from Zhejiang province, which is famous for Longjing green teas. So that's my, mm. you know, if I feel a bit homesick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoy a lovely cuppa this weekend. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Julian Webster, she's the owner and founder of the Chinese Tea Company in London. Thanks. Well, Chinese heavyweight boxer Zhang Jilei is in London on the training camp. Earlier, I spoke to him about his recent defeat to Joseph Parker, his rematch against the interim heavyweight champion, and the possibility of a fight in China in the future. <laughs> I'll be training in London till the 15th of April.
The training has been going very well. I just finished a match on March the 9th. Your previous fight against Joseph Parker in March ended um, in defeat, though it floored him twice. So can you talk us through what's happened? I probably didn't have the same mentality as when I fought Joe Joyce, because when I fought Joyce, I told myself I was going to take the belt from him. And then in the second fight, it was guarding the belt. The desire to defeat him was very strong. After defeating Joyce, I became overconfident, which made me a bit too relaxed when fighting Joseph Parker. In fact, in the first half of the fight, I had the upper hand totally. Towards the end, he changed his tactics. He tried to control the distance so I couldn't hit him. I started to feel anxious. After the game, I thought about it. I did have a lot of training for that, including what to do when he held me. But somehow I didn't get my head around it in the second half of the game. I failed to draw on some of the strategies. And I understand you're going to have a rematch with Joseph Parker. So when will that be? We signed a rematch clause before the fight as an interim heavyweight champion of the World Boxing Organization. I was entitled to a rematch if I lost. If I had won, we wouldn't have a rematch. The second fight will happen at the end of this year. We hear that there could be the potential of an upcoming fight in China. So is that true? And how are the negotiations coming along? We are working towards that right now, striving to bring a match to China. Is that difficult to have a fight in China? There are some difficulties now, but we are working to make it happen. Our entire team, including the finance team, is working on it. Mm. And can you explain how a major heavyweight fight in China would impact China's boxing? Um, well, I think that if a top boxing championship match is held in China, it will be a source of inspiration for China's boxers and Chinese boxing fans. That way, Chinese fans will be able to see the world's top boxing championship at home. In the 1970s, China has this uh, ping-pong diplomacy. Um, do you see yourself as a boxing diplomat? Mm, China has been developing rapidly in recent decades, and so have China's sports. Since the Beijing Olympics in 2008, when Chinese athletes won the most gold medals for the first time, the entire Chinese sports industry has had a big leap forward. For me, I want to let the world know about China through boxing and then let China know more about the world. Well, finally today, the shorts worn by Muhammad Ali in his legendary thriller in Manila fight are expected to smash auction records at Sotheby's in New York. Online bids for the white satin Everlast trunks, which Ali signed with a black pen, have already reached $3.8 million. Experts say the shorts could fetch more than $6 million when they go under the hammer next week. The, one, the 1975 fight against Smoking Joe Frazier in 49 degrees heat for the third and final matchup between the boxing legends. Ali won after 14 punishing rounds is regarded as one of the most brutal fights in the history of boxing. All right, before we go, our headlines once more. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she wants good relations with China, but that requires a level playing field. The U.N. Secretary General pleads for Israel to end its operation in Gaza as the conflict approaches the six-month mark. And Iran vows to punish Israel over its alleged role in the killing of seven officers in a strike on its embassy in Syria. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. Coming up next on CGTN Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all the team in London, goodbye. Goodbye.